Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. To use Squad Help and launch a naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Today on the podcast, Gareth K, co-founder of Chapter, a San Francisco-based creative studio. This season of How Brands Are Built is all about brand positioning, and I was excited to talk to Gareth because while he's a strategist, he doesn't come from the world of traditional brand consulting that I come from and so many of my guests come from. Gareth got his start in advertising at firms like Goodby Silverstein and Partners, where he was chief strategy officer. I've always thought of Gareth as one of the most thoughtful, strategic people from the advertising world. He has some great ideas about the need for flexibility and prototyping in brand development. Take a listen to what he has to say, and please reach out with any questions or comments, and don't forget to rate and review the show so others can find it too. Here's my conversation with Gareth. Gareth Kay, thank you so much for joining the show. Rob, thank you very much indeed for the invite to join. So tell me a little bit about Chapter, the agency that you now run. How big is it? What kind of work are you doing and what types of clients do you have? Of course. Um, So we're a relatively young company, Rob. We're about three and a bit years old now. Um, We have about 10 people full time. So as a company, um, we talk very much um, about being um, a creative uh, studio that is really um, designed and focused on designing soulful brands that thrive in an age of unreasonable customer expectations. And we do this by making things that close the growing disconnect between what people expect and what brands currently offer. And that disconnect is huge and it is growing. You used a couple of phrases in there. You you called yourselves a creative studio. Um, And it sounded like from some of what you were saying, you're trying to move away from what would traditionally be thought of as an advertising agency. Is that, and and that's a purposeful uh, decision. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Rob. I mean, I think, you know, when we started up, I mean, I loved working in the world of advertising for whatever it was, 15, 16 years. I was very, very lucky to work at some great companies with some great people on some, you know, great brands doing, I think, really interesting work. But my sense was there was a need to try and build um, a different type of creative company that was perhaps a little bit less constrained by some of the legacy of the past. And I think more importantly, um, not constrained by silos or by channels. And that really led to the decision to try and build something a little bit more from the ground up. So we do talk about ourselves as being a studio. Um, that's partly to reflect the type of size of company we want to be. Uh, We don't want to be another 100-person agency or creative company. Uh, I don't think the world needs that nowadays, to be quite honest. Um, We also call ourselves a studio because we want to really stress that we're not just consultants. Um, We actually make things, and we really believe in the kind of power of applied strategy, which is showing the thing, not just showing the PowerPoint slides. So... So you mentioned the the history in advertising, though, uh, you know, the, the first 15 years of your career, and, and you really come from that world, and, and I don't. So one of the reasons I, I was excited to talk to you is to get a little bit of an outside perspective on this world that I've come up in of, of really brand consulting. I'd love to hear your your thoughts and, and to the degree that you can um, share what you think the general perception of the brand consulting world is amongst people in the advertising world. So I'm talking about when I say brand consulting, David Ocker, Interbrand, Landor, these big agencies. I think that's a, it's a great question. I think it's very difficult to kind of, you know, paint with a broad brush because like all types of companies, particularly companies in the kind of advice business, mm-hmm. there are good companies and there are less good companies, you know, and I'm a huge fan, for example, of David and what he's doing at Profit. I think they're a really interesting org. Mm-hmm. I think there's definitely a growing um, awareness of brand consultancies uh, inside agencies. And I think that's because more and more clients are using them. So, you know, increasingly towards the end of my time um, at Goodby Silverstein, we were seeing more and more briefs that were coming in from clients that had basically gone through the brand consultancy first. So a lot of the kind of thinking around what does the brand stand for 
um, how does the brand behave and feel out there in the world um, had been done by the uh, brand agencies. And when it was good, you would be a little bit uh, miffed because it was something that certainly <laughs> as a strategist you really loved doing was actually cracking the bigger fort right. around the brand. Um, but then you get really angry when you were given something that may look clever on a piece of paper, uh, but actually was not very useful to you because, frankly, it was unexecutable. Right. Or, or worse still, was a piece of thinking that was um, clearly designed to get through the armies of different interests inside a client organization. Sure, built and consensus. Kind of got, yeah, and it kind of got watered down to be a piece of consensus or committee speak that really had lost all its teeth and lost all its kind of... Uh, point of view and sharpness through rounds and rounds of meetings and <laughs> consensus building. So I think those are kind of the two big moments where you kind of went, oh my Lord. Yeah. Do you what feel are we like, going to go and do now? Do you, do you feel like on some fundamental level though, there's a difference between how um, a advertising agencies think about brand versus how brand consultancies think hmm. about it? Or, do, or is it again, just hard to generalize? It's, it's hard to generalize, but I think, you know, when it's done well, I think good agency strategists, for example, are really good expansive thinkers about the totality of the brand. You said expansive, I, but I, I expansive, thought I heard expensive. Yes. No, well, expansive <laughs> and expensive as well. You know, when, when done properly, Rob, when done properly. Um, it was no reason why those two uh, words have got just literally one uh, vowel that's different between them. Um, but uh, I, I, I kind of feel that there's a growing trend, sadly, inside agencies where there's been this kind of uh, increasing specialization, uh, this increasing commoditization as a result of that. So increasingly what masquerades as brand thinking actually is advertising campaign thinking. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking about what's a kind of interesting nugget we can build an ad campaign around. A great saying that um, I think Mark Waits, who's one of the partners of Mother, in London once said, which was, you know, too many agencies basically walk into the meeting room and go, you know, here's your ad, now what's your problem? Right. And they see the kind of world as being full of advertising uh, sized holes to fill. I think they perhaps live in a, a model of thinking where they believe advertising um, is a strong lever and a strong uh, pr uh, determinant of the overall brand rather than the reality, which is, it is but one part and arguably an increasingly less strong part um, of the overall brand personality. Speaking of, of just brand thinking, I, I was really interested in an article you wrote last year called The Brand Word. It was published in WARC, uh, I think that's how you say it, W-A-R-C. Um, and in it, you argue that we should be more careful about how we use the word brand. I, I just wanna read a little bit of what you wrote to jog your memory. Um, it says, when you think about how we throw the term brand about, more often than not, we are describing something we do, a brand strategy or campaign, not the associations we are trying to create. We use it too often to create a false sense of control and a mistaken belief that we manage the brand. The models we use reinforce this. The tools of temples and pyramids are about what we build, not how people respond to them. The tools we use to shape brands are not fit for purpose. They are used to create simplicity and consistency, which run counter to a culture of complexity and change. So I'm, of course, intimately familiar with those temples and pyramids. That's the, <laughs> the stuff of brand consulting in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not necessarily a big fan of them, uh, at least some of the time. So I was hoping you could um, give a little more detail on what's wrong with them in, in your view and what we should be using instead, if anything. Okay. Um, yes, I think there's probably two thoughts that kind of lie uh, inside that. The first is around the old classic thing around stimulus and response. And the reality is brands are a response uh, to something out there in the world. It's what people feel. It is the kind of patterns and associations that get formed in someone's minds, uh, sometimes knowingly, more often than not unknowingly. And I think it comes back again to that notion of starting with people and working back from there and trying to understand what are the associations the kind of mental reinforcements you are trying to build in someone's mind to make them feel more favorably to brand X rather than brand Y. The unfortunate thing is inside 
I think many advice companies and ad agencies are particularly guilty of this, is that we think a brand is about something we do. It's about, you know, brand campaigns. It's about, you know, the brand temple. Mm-hmm. And it is literally about, you know, we will, particularly in ad agency world, say these things to people and that will make them do something or think or feel something as a result rather than thinking much more about, you know, how do we want people to feel about this brand um, and then trying to work back from there to work out how can you best build those associations over time. So I think it's that kind of first issue, which mm-hmm. is just the old, you know, problem of stimulus versus response and sometimes uh, mistakenly conflating those two things. I think then the kind of second thought, which is around, I guess, the tools we use is we've got a couple of problems. Um, one is language and words by themselves are a very lossy form of compression. I mean, we're trying to pack very complex ideas, quite often quite intangible, soft ideas into words. And the danger becomes we don't really pick very good words that really capture that sentiment because they're just hard to find. And then secondly, those words get misconstrued Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what their meaning are, depending on who you are, the context you see those words in, et cetera. So there's kind of an issue, I think, with trying to use words as a medium for getting across the sensibility of a brand. Secondly, I just think all the tools we build are designed to be I would argue less about distillation and more about kind of reduction. And, you know, I'm a big believer that simplicity is really, really important and really, really powerful. Um, But that should be distillation of uh, thinking that leads to simplicity rather than kind of maybe slightly kind of brutal reduction where we're kind of chopping off arms and limbs uh, to get to something, which I think is far too often the case in terms of those models. On top of that, I would just say, that those are models that were built to basically build consensus mm-hmm. inside client organizations. They're built to, frankly, stand alone on one page on a chart. So you get to, you know, the temples and the brand pyramids and the brand keys, all of which, you know, have got some value. I'm not trying to kind of say they are meaningless, but I think we put way too much weight on you know what these words mean you end up having you know far too many meetings as my friend russell davis used to kind of you know complain about where you'll be discussing whether a brand is funny or whether it's humorous and literally right. spending you know four months and umpteen dollars in research to try and disentangle this you kind of go is that really the best use of our time of our money of our resources i've been on those calls and in those meetings so i i, I they're joyous aren't they yes and I, I hear what you're saying i guess i want to push back on a couple of points I, on the one hand i agree with so much of what you're saying i, I get that um, some of these these models with all of their boxes that need to be filled in with words I, a friend of mine used to call them parking lots in that yes. anyone on the leadership team of the client could have their word that they wanted to make sure was in there, their idea. And it just became a parking lot for everyone's ideas. And uh, it ended up meaning nothing. Um, So I I hear you on that. But in terms of using words to try to capture these intangible ideas, what what better tools do we have other than words? I mean, what should we be using if we're not trying to use language to articulate and capture the essence of, of a brand? Well, we have a mantra here, which is show the thing. Um, So it's about trying to bake the thinking that we're doing and the journey we're going on, not in words, but actually in things that a real person in the world might see or be exposed. It's not like making a fully blown thing, but it's prototyping Mm -hmm. what a brand might look, feel, behave like. So whether it's thinking about, you know, what might a poster for this brand look like or what might uh, an experience for this brand feel, whether that's kind of a new product or whether that's a web experience. I think it's much more about trying to show the reality of the thing rather than having this kind of um, intermediation of the the words on a chart and i kind of had this revelation about the power of showing the thing when i worked with the creative lab at google and andy burnt is an absolute genius i love the guy he is because got amazing energy and i think he's built a creative company who we greatly admire i mean often we talk about ourselves as trying to in many ways 
emulate what the Creative Lab does, emulate what the Eam Studio did uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And it's really about, you know, not building charts that have words on there, but actually very quickly in no more than three slides, you know, expressing what the challenge or the situation is, what the opportunity can be, and then beginning to show what that actually might feel like if you were a real person in the world, as opposed to kind of building some kind of tool that by its very nature will have some kind of bias about thinking in there. Um, and by its very nature, you'll be making decisions to get to a set of words, whether it's a kind of reductive nature of uh, sacrifice, you know, the heart of strategy, or to your point, the parking lots where you're leaving space for the CEO, the mm -hmm. CFO, and the CFO to go and dump their words into um, to make them feel better about life. So it's just about trying to, you know, in many ways, jump to the end, uh, really begin to help people see what the brand might feel like, what it might behave like. This episode of How Brands Are Built is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency-level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squad help, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. This episode is also brought to you by Rev.com, offering fast, affordable, accurate audio transcription and captions. I've used Rev a bunch of times to transcribe episodes of this podcast, but also for interviews that I've recorded while conducting brand strategy projects for my clients. I've tried some of the other services out there and I keep coming back to Rev because their transcriptions are some of the most accurate I've seen. Their turnaround time is less than 24 hours, sometimes only 12, and transcriptions cost just $1 a minute. Right now, Rev is offering listeners of this show $10 off your first order. So that's 10 minutes of transcription. To get your $10 off coupon, visit rev.com slash blog slash HBAB for how brands are built. Again, that's rev.com slash blog slash HBAB. Rev, transcriptions made simple. So I take that to mean you guys at Chapter are not using any sort of brand model that, that consistently oh. articulates what a brand stands for. Well, we have a brand model, but it's just very different, I think, to the ones I worked with you know, in my past. So we're, you know, lots of people are using this terminology now, but we have a model where we talk about a brand operating system. Mm -hmm. So it's really thinking about what is the underlying code and principles that informs everything a brand does. So it's not just about what does the brand say it's much more about you know how does actually the brand behave feel uh turn up in the world and that's about essentially three layers of things so one is around what's your belief so what does this brand genuinely believe um in the world what is the problem it's trying to solve for people or what is the opportunity that it's trying to see so mm -hmm. that's where you're really doing the work of trying to express the human problem or opportunity that lies behind the business problem or opportunity. You then have falling out of that belief um, a purpose. Now, that's the most, I guess I wish we weren't using that word still because I think it's become incredibly used and a buzzword and become mistaken. But really, that is about what do you do as a brand given your belief? So if you believe X about the world, you are going to do Y in reaction to that. Mm -hmm. And then rather than having, you know, those kind of, you know, adjective soup games of tone of voice or main message or reasons to believe, we just have a thing we call pursuits. So that's basically um, because we believe this and we're going to go and do this about it in the world, in order to fulfill our purpose, we will do the following things, which are normally three very action-oriented uh, sets of principles. And we find that just kind of, kind of, you know, thinking about building the brand that way, it takes less uh, it takes away, it removes the pressure on each word that's in there. Mm -hmm. It becomes something that's more instructional and inspirational for people. So can you give one example of a pursuit that a brand might use, whether it's a real case or a hypothetical? 
So we worked with um, Silent Circle. Silent Circle initially were a company that offered uh, apps for um, your phone, whether it's an Apple device or an Android device. They gave you very secure, highly encrypted messaging um, and phone calls. They realized that actually there's a bigger opportunity to think about actually could we create uh, a phone, a piece of hardware in our own device of our own operating system on it that was, you know, the most secure uh, mobile device for anyone. They were absolutely mindset uh, and locked in on security as being their big thing. We talked to them actually about, it sounds semantic, but there's a difference between privacy and security. Mm -hmm. sure. Security is almost born out of a reactive, please don't let me get hacked. Privacy is a bit more of a kind of an optimistic thing. And frankly, a piece of language that real people talk about much more often. So for them, their operating system, we had a belief which is based on, you know, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, uh, that privacy is a right. We built a purpose falling out of that belief, which is about putting you in control of privacy. And I think the in control piece was really important and you being in control of it. So you weren't literally just relying on the platform to do it. It was about creating, yes, a more secure infrastructure to enable privacy, but it's also about trying to help people understand things they could do when they were using not just a, a black phone, but frankly, any form of technology mm -hmm. to live uh, a more private life. And those are down to your actions as much as they are down to, you know, what a manufacturer will do for you. And then we had three simple pursuits that kind of uh, flowed from that purpose of putting you in control of privacy. So in order to do this, the first thing was creating a simple and secure starting point for communication. That meant we actually helped redesign the onboarding experience uh, for the black phone when the first phones launched. Uh, the onboarding felt remarkably secure. It took about three hours and 57 screens. <laughs> so it was really secure, but it just felt incredibly onerous and not very seamless. So we worked with them to create an onboarding that had all the security of before, but could be done in five screens and three minutes. So kind of on a par with setting up any other type of phone. Secondly, is about providing proof, not just promises. So we really wanted to make sure that the communication we did was really about demonstrating what we did as a company to put you in control of privacy, but also to give you the tools, tips, education to live a more private life. And then thirdly, it was about continually setting the standard for privacy without compromise. So our kind of big push on them was, yes, we can live private lives, but honestly, to do that, you've almost had to go into the disconnect from the internet and put a, a silver hat on your head made out of foil and be in a room <laughs> covered in foil. But actually, it's about trying to you know deliver an experience in the phone that was del as delightful and as seamless and as useful as uh, the best Android devices or an iPhone, but had all the privacy in there. So really thinking about, you know, if we are making something that's private by design, how can we do that while still not making you compromise on what you want to do or the type of experience you were going through? Great. So that's a that's a great example. Thanks for for running through that. So what's the process that you use to get to that brand operating system? And importantly, how do you avoid the the sort of consensus driven approach that we talked about earlier and, and the wordsmithing that seems to be sure. inevitable sometimes? Well, I mean, it feels like there's, you know, there's a there's a lot of work that will go into creating kind of, you know, what that system can be. And part of that is doing the homework. So, you mm -hmm. know, talking to people. Uh, looking at the competitive landscape, looking at perhaps adjacent brands in different categories that perhaps have tackled similar types of problems or see similar types of opportunities, what we can learn from them. But I think the joy of the operating system is, one, you haven't got – uh, so rigorous a set of, you know, here's five values that the brand needs to have. It's much more about directional instructions rather than putting pressure on individual words. And then secondly, it's about showing how that comes to life very, very quickly. So you're in many ways asking less people to buy the words that exist perhaps on a page and you are going, do you believe those instructions are right to create a brand that feels like this 
and can begin to build associations in people's minds around these things. So it just takes the pressure, I think, mm -hmm. Rob, in many ways, off the words, um, off the kind of architecture, quote unquote, right. and actually begins to help people see what the finished building might look like. You know, renders, I think, are much more powerful than blueprints. Great. So a couple of wrap up questions. Uh, are there any brands out there? And I'm going to stipulate a, a rule here. You can't choose one of your own clients. <laughs> are there any brands that you just feel like are doing everything right? Good Lord. Uh, that is a, a heck of a question. Honestly, I think so many brands are a little bit broken at the moment. In fact, you look at all the data that comes out of the um, Havas Meaningful Brand study, study, and they basically say that most people couldn't care if three out of four brands disappear tomorrow. So you've immediately got, you know, one in four brands that seem to have some type of value to people. So that's kind of becomes quite a good reductive exercise in the first place. Um, I mean, I guess I'll just talk about a brand that I personally feel is yeah. just absolutely nailing it is uh, a brand that comes out of the UK. Um, it's a brand that was set up by a guy called David Hyatt, uh, called Hyatt Denim. Uh, David was an ex-advertising copywriter. Uh, his first business was an amazing uh, clothing brand really designed for cyclists called Howie's. Mm -hmm. um, they did lots of brilliant stuff around their brand. Um, but Hyatt Denim is just, I just, there's just a wonderful thing about it where it feels incredibly natural and organic. So there's a lovely human ambition they have for the brand, which is to um, become the biggest denim manufacturer in Cardigan in the north of Wales. So there's no sense of, hey, we want to be the world's biggest brand. What they're trying to do is breathe life back into uh, what was once the dominant industry. Um, inside a town that basically lost its way um, and was really, you know, a brand that had, sorry, a town that had so many people with amazing craftsman skills to make the best jeans that were out there and had basically been lost by the forces of commoditization and badly run businesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a, a wonderful way he's giving back to the community. So he tells amazing stories about, you know, the regeneration of a town, which they're playing a, a, a small part in. Um, but I think when he gets down to, you know, how they market the brand, there's just this lovely mantra they have about doing one thing well. They're not trying to build chinos and shirts and everything else. They make really damn good jeans. And as a result of that, they produce some lovely stuff where – there's a great weekly newsletter where they tell stories about what's going on in the factory in a very kind of engaging, humble way. Um, they tell stories and they point towards other brands that they believe do one thing really, really well, That's which creates great. this lovely neighborhood of brands that they associate themselves with. Mm -hmm. And then they make this absolutely delightful annual report, as they call it every year, which is not the financial annual report. It's just a story of the town, of the people, some of the product they made, of those brands that do one thing well. I think similar to them, um, Allbirds, who mm -hmm. probably sort of got a remarkable valuation for what is basically a two-year-old company at the moment, but just their obsession with making, you know, a more comfortable sneaker made from amazing high-quality wool from New Zealand is just a, a pretty awesome story in what they're doing. They're doing some really lovely little activations now so they've got this great partnership for example with air new zealand which is a natural partner for them given the wool comes from new zealand mm -hmm. um where they're making um face masks for the premium cabins now out of the wool they use uh to make their sneakers and they made the face masks just feel full of whimsy um and, <laughs> and full of kind of love and just something that's worth honestly talking about and putting a photo up on instagram yeah because they look cool. Yeah, those are two great examples. I'm familiar with all birds, but not the denim brand. So I'll check that out. Um, so last question. And I know you do a lot, Gareth, in, in what you write. And um, before we started recording, we were talking about the uh, the pl online planning school. So I know yeah. you do a lot to give back to the community of strategists and planners out there. But just given the success you've had in your career, I'm curious what one piece of advice you have for young people that are interested in getting into, whether it's planning in the more traditional advertising space or just generally strategy in, in sort of the brand and marketing world. Oh, my Lord. Well, there's, you know, the, the, the pat answer is do everything you can to be curious about the world you live in. So 
stop reading advertising books, advertising blogs, marketing books, marketing blogs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and take time to observe the world around you. Get off your computer, get off your phone, walk around, listen to people's conversations, try and find interesting stuff that's going on in culture, and think about what you can learn from it, and build that kind of bank of just rich stuff in the world to learn from. I think that's one really important thing I would ask people to do because I think you just fill your mind with just really interesting random stuff. I think the second thing is um, maximize your chance of interesting collisions being formed and building uh, an interesting take on the type of work you do. And that's really about being less obsessed about the companies you work for and the brands you work on and really spotting really interesting, generous people to work with who have different takes on what strategy is and can be. Because I'm a big believer. There's a great uh, adage that uh, Jeremy Bullmore from WPP Mm -hmm. uses about how brands are built like birds um, build their nest from the kind of scraps and straws they chance upon. (laughs) I think the, the same is true of how you build up your planning or strategy style. There's no right answer. If there was MBAs would rule the world and actually MBAs would now be going out of business because AI and machine learning would begin to rule the world because it would be some type of, you know, rule-based binary form of decision making. The reality is there's an infinite number of ways of doing strategy. So a real argument in favor of eclecticism and yes, a little bit of a little bit of randomness, a lack yeah. of prescriptiveness, I think is kind of a theme across everything you're saying. I I love it. So Gareth, thank you so much for joining and um, hope to talk to you again soon. Rob, likewise. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. If you liked the episode, please leave a rating and review and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about Gareth and Chapter, visit chaptersf.com or find Gareth on LinkedIn. He's also a prolific writer, and I'll post some links to articles that he's written in the show notes for this episode on howbrandsarebuilt.com. While you're there, you can also find other articles and blog posts, sign up for the newsletter, and find all of our social media profiles. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.